and 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 Jose, yeah, and and uh, uh, there's this wonderful critique of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness by Chinua Achebe. So, so inferiorization uh, is one of the residues that we have to struggle with. Second is invisibilization. A, a, a lot of a lot of what the uh, post-colonial has to deal with is their stories and their narratives which disappear from dominant discourses. So in, invisibilization. Much of it happens because of historical erasure. The colonial authorities erased records, erased practices, erased cultural memories. And there's this classic book uh, about how uh, the, the records of uh, you know, uh, colonial rule in large parts of the colony, particularly this refers to, to English rule, uh, were ordered to be burnt or dumped in the ocean. There's a book by Ian Cobain called The History Thieves uh, that, that uh, records this. So erasure, amnesia, amnesia. I come from Goa, which was part of the colonial, uh, the Portuguese colonial. And uh, one of the strategies of the post Portuguese colonial was to erase uh, the, the connection with, uh, with the larger cultural and civilizational landscape in which uh, we, were, you know, we were located. And to, in a sense, connect us with Europe. Disconnect us from India, connect us with Europe, Eurasia. And, and of course, this whole process, this multiple pronged uh, attack of the, colonial, of the colonial state in the colonial period resulted in uh, what uh, the Bengali philosopher calls the enslavement of minds. Now it is this that we need to fight because it persists, even though political colonialism has ended, uh, intellectual colonialism persists. It persists, as Said says in his Orientalism, it persists in terms of the hegemony of certain frameworks. It persists in terms of the dominance and the persistence of the epistemology of the South. So, so how, what do we do? So how, how does one respond to that? Now, this is a formidable fortress of intellectual domination. I mean, your platform is one attempt at, in a sense, uh, breaching that fortress. It's a formidable fortress. I mean, just, you know, a few books and a few articles here and there, uh, you know, don't really do very much. We have to breach that fortress. And, 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 and I certainly, and, and, and I, I, I'm sure Rukmini shares my view, that we can discuss that. I certainly see that one way of breaching that fortress is through language. So when Rukmini invited me to be part of her project, this, is, this was her conceptual, uh, it, she conceptualized it. Uh, when she invited me to be part of the project, uh, I uh, joined in because I saw, okay, this was an opportunity to, in a sense, use language to breach the fortress of, of uh, hegemony uh, of the uh, global north. And, and we did that by, by uh, identifying concepts. So our book, in a sense, is the uniqueness about the book, even though it has sort of genealogy of linking it up with Raymond Williams's work, has the, has the uniqueness in that it has 200 contributors in, uh, submitting 250 entries. Or, uh, and, and these are organized along seven rubrics. And the concepts range from high-level high concepts to mid-level concepts, to fun concepts. And you will see from the table of contents which has been circulated, that what we have done is, uh, is uh, identify a set of concepts that don't meet the high table of conceptual discourse in the humanities and social sciences. These are not concepts that appear when, when, we, when we go to international seminars or when we go to, uh, you know, to list, when we give the great books lectures or we give the the, the, the canon, when, when we discuss the canon. These are concepts that are rooted in certain cultures. These are concepts that are rooted in certain histories. These are concepts that carry a baggage of meanings, uh, which we think needs to, be, uh, needs to be made available, not just to an Indian audience, because remember we are hegemonized by, by, by English, but needs to be av <coughs> available to a global audience. Why not? So for example, let's, let me give you an illustration. There's a word juta. Juta means food which is contaminated by the touch of a person described as inferior. 
described as uh, this is a it's a terrible, very offensive word uh, in, in in Indian cultural practice. It, but but if you have access to that word, you can in a sense through that word come to understand the whole structures of domination and, and exclusion and oppression uh, that has been part of the Indian cultural landscape. Or take for example uh, a fun word like time pass. Now this it seems like an English word. I'm sure. To audiences all over the world, it would sound like, what does time pass mean? Time pass in the kind of everyday cultural space in India is about just spending time doing very little but gossiping. So we've got that as well in our, in our lexicon. Now, how do we do this? I mean, since, since I, we've agreed to sort of speak for a very short while. So if one way of reaching the fortress is to uh, think of language, and to use language as, an, as, as, as a sort of battering tool, and, and to do that by, by uh, identifying a set of concepts from our linguistic spaces. Like, I suppose, if you were in Africa, you would talk in terms of Kagisano in South Africa, you would talk of Ubuntu in Southern Africa. Uh, uh, so, so there are concepts all over the world which need to be brought into the uh, seminar room of the humanities and social sciences. How did we do this? We, do the, we did this by adopting a four-part strategy. Uh, we did this uh, with, a, with a very clear idea that we will infiltrate the, 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 com the comfort zones of the hegemonic conceptual universe, you know, German, French, English, Latin. We'll do that by introducing into that world concepts from the Indian linguistic space. Concepts which are, which are high value concepts like Swaraj. I mean, it doesn't require, it's, it has, it, it, it acquires the same kind of conceptual weight as freedom or liberty. And yet it means it, it has a nuance which needs to be uncovered. Or for example, Izzat, uh, which means honor, dignity. Uh, again, it, it comes from Persian, it comes, it comes in, from Urdu into, into the Indian cultural space. But it, it, it covers a range of meanings that I think humanities and social sciences needs to use. Because I want to suggest that uh, the HSS space does not adequately represent us. It, it does not capture the meanings that, 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 that we think are significant. So infiltrate is strategy number one. Strategy number two is to elevate, to take concepts from our world and give them respectability. So for example, uh, Janjat. Janjat means troublesome. Uh, so give it respectability. Why do we have to all, always use English or French words? Third is to appropriate which, words which have their provenance in English or, or Portuguese and give them Indian meanings. So from Portuguese would be susegad or, 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 or saudad. Uh, but see how it has new meanings uh, in the Goan landscape. Uh, similarly, uh, from England, you would take a word like tension or setting or file and, and in, infuse it with Indian meanings. You will see that in our lexicon. I hope some of you have had an opportunity to see that. And the fourth strategy is to populate. So if we infiltrate the conceptual universe with Indian concepts, if we elevate Indian concepts to, to, to a certain respectable status in the humanities and social science discourse, if, if scholars begin to use words, instead of saying, for example, it was a, it was a, it was a Herculean task, uh, we could say it's a Hanumanian task. Now, those of you who know one of the great Indian epics, the Ramayana, will know that Hanuman was this very powerful, very strong, devotee of, of the central character, Lord Ram. So one can begin to complicate and, 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 and challenge the comfort zones of, of Northern epistemologies. Uh, so, so if we infiltrate, if, if we elevate, if we appropriate concepts from there and make them Indian concepts like tension, tension is a wonderful word. It has an in English origin. But it, it is used in all the Indian languages, all. And, and you know, India is a very plural linguistic space. And it has the same meaning in all the languages because it, it has now acquired a kind of folk ownership of the concept. Uh, then we will be able to, uh, in a sense, uh, get 
the, the the community of humanities and social sciences outside their comfort zone. I believe this may be happening. Uh, this may be happening in, uh, in, uh, in in North America. I mean, let's call it if I if I could use a metaphor, let's call it you know a certain kind of jazz uh, you know <laughs> jazz radicalism in language. You know, can we make language uh, break out of the classical uh, formats? You know, in terms of idiom, vocabulary, grammar. Uh, and, and make it speak to, to the lives uh, that, that we come from. Uh, I'll end on that note and hand it over to Rukmini. Hi, everyone. So like Peter, I want to begin by thanking Penn State for inviting us to speak at this African Studies Global Virtual for Forum on Decoloniality and Southern Epistemologies. Peter has already spoken to you about the various strategies for decolonization and the way in which he sees our recent collaborative work in keywords, which, as he's just pointed out to you, drew on the scholarship and enthusiasm and um, of a very, uh, and generally the expertise of a very large collective of over 200 Indians who were not all academics, but who were all deeply absorbed in the history and the epistemology of the words that they wrote on. So, uh, but when I saw this rubric for the first time, I asked myself, what on earth can someone like myself, whose life and whose experiences of language use are so vastly different from that of say, uh, speakers of Swahili or Kosa, let alone a phalanx of other languages and cultural heritage of the African continent, heritages on the African continent, have to contribute to an Africa-led debate on decoloniality. There was plenty of richness there. So I was puzzled in asking myself, what is the epistemic state of decoloniality? Is it in fact a state of, of mind? a social process or a sort of hybrid production. Now asking myself these sorts of questions in the bold and barefaced way that I've just posed uh, them has for me at any rate, something of the absurdity, but also the imaginative stretch of that old Superman formulation. It's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Superman. And in my view, a view that I've also strongly advanced in the keywords volume, which we are discussing today, is that we never should, as theorists, repeat and reverse the colonial era of thinking of uh, in, thinking in terms of any sort of civilizing mission, even if it's one in which we deeply believe, and taking on the omniscient role, rescuing role of a superman. Decoloniality cannot afford to be a superman or even a superwoman. Indeed, as I maintained long ago in one of my books, Narrative Gravity, as far as I'm concerned, even Nietzsche's towering superman is actually a fragile construct of affixes such as subs, paras, metas, trances, alters, pseudos, uns, semis, etc. So in other words, my first proposition today in trying to discuss the idea of not of post-coloniality, but of decoloniality or um, decolonization is that in academia today, we need to make a concerted attempt to consider subjects and objects that have long been via powerful hegemonic social strategies such as colonialism or caste, just part of our peripheral vision. For example, consider our current stances in India in our, under our present government, where the rich lessons of the Mughal period, 14th to 18th centuries in our subcontinental history, are being erased and confined to exactly such a peripheral vision. And tremendous insights are being lost. For example, I've been reading recently the 15th century Akbar Nama, 16th century Akbar Nama, and it records a remarkable linguistic experiment conducted by the Emperor Akbar. 
the Mughal emperor in the 16th century. And what Akbar wanted to find out, because India was so complex, so multifarious, what would be the first language in which infants spoke? So what he did was to actually uh, uh, um, in, not imprison, but lock up a group of children completely with wet nurses and feet food and everything else, but he instructed the vet nurses never to speak to the children because he wanted to find out what the first language was. And he waited for four years and then he went back to the gun mahal or the dumb house as it was called. And the date he says, they say it was the 9th of August in 1582. And the next day, he went to, after, on the 10th of August, he went to what's called the House of Experiment. And no cry, says the text, came from that House of Silence, nor was any speech heard there. In spite of the four years, they heard no part of the talisman of speech and nothing came out but the noise of the dumb. That this tells us a lot about the history, the complex linguistic history under which, in, within which we undertake a project like keywords. Of course, we can't conduct such experiments today, but I want to maintain here that there's much that we can learn from them and their experimental spirit with regard to language and culture. If only we looked in these directions. I believe such retrievals from a historic, for, from a historically peripheral vision are an important aspect of decolonization. Colonial regiments have, of course, always thrived on strong forms of structural binarism, self and other, ruler and so on, so, um, ruler and rule and whatnot. And this is unsurprising because the categories are seductively obvious and their combinatorial properties so marvelously well ordered. The difficulty, however, with the structuralist paradigm even uh, uh, critical race theory is that the idea of context is very difficult to retain. And part of my own argument, which I have discussed at length in many other places, is that the colonial materials neatly left out, that the contextual materials neatly left out, ex excised from structural analyses including narrative analysis, which is a field I publish in, the Nietzschean subscripts, as it were, turn out to be far more uh, cognitively instructive than one might reasonably expect. That's in our keywords book. I emphasized to our publishers when they asked me a few years ago if I had a book in mind for them, that rather than a self-authored book, we could do this keywords book but we could only do it if the contributors were mostly Indian, not for chauvinistic reasons, but because they were masters of the Nietzschean subscripts, as it were. They had the experiential basis, the knowledge of the emotional residues that could only come from living within the, with the day-to-day common -day rooms and vocabulary that the subcontinent experimented with on a quotidian basis. And Peter has mentioned many of these words like tension and so on to, to you. It was by this process of thinking, in fact, that we were able to include in our keywords book categories of words that had never before been included in any keywords uh, volume, uh, including Raymond Williams' absolutely amazing volume. And we were able to in introduce the three categories I've mentioned here, material culture words, such as chula, balti, chappal. You know, chula means the oven, wood oven, which, we, which women across the world, uh, across India cook and chappal, which means slipper, which you leave outside doors. We were able to include acronyms, such as VIP and VVIP, which I know is one of Peter's favorite entries, uh, because these acronyms were part, in my view, of what modernity was, and every society has its own acronyms. Then we had borrowings from the English, alongside the high culture words that Peter mentioned, like democracy, nonviolence. So, so this constituted a tactic, if not a strategy, 
high level strategy for de democratizing the linguistically colonized, dominated by English and the haute couture languages of India, or the high classical languages of India. So we have English, we have the high classical languages, and then we have languages which are never seen. So I have argued elsewhere, and not entirely in jest, that when the British left India, I don't know what they did elsewhere, but when they left India, they left us three ambiguous gifts. With whose effects we're still struggling in our attempts to decolonize. These were the magic mirror of Pakistan into which we still look and where we still have deep conflicts. The seven league boots of the English language through which Peter has spoken about this, where we can travel everywhere, but we burn the soles of our feet. And the wonderful labyrinthine labyrinth of the Indian bureaucracy. Now, Peter and I were both born into a newly independent India, which was in the throes of reimagining its assimilation state, given this exceedingly odd inheritance. And one of the first acts of this nascent entity, the Republic of India, was to redo the map of India as a conglomeration of linguistic states, each with its own language, and to undertake to retain English just for 15 years, until the languages of India regain their strength. So it's one of the great ironies of our history, and I would like to compare this with other histories, that we now have to grapple with the challenge of asking ourselves today, how we should deal with the aspirational role that English plays in our country today as a lifestyle, a lifeline, and some say a pillar language. So just to summarize towards the end, as a linguist, I want to summarize four possible small scale linguistic tactics for decolonization. One is the retrieval of flat fragments, by which I mean paying careful attention to fragments of languages such as words, but also affixes, presuppositions, compl prepositions, complements, etc., that we tend to absorb in grammatical analysis, as well as discourse forms, especially those in the orality literacy continuum that, is, that, has, that have largely been ignored in conventional forms of linguistic theorizing, such as narratives, riddles, proverbs, conversational conventions. And this, I believe, will give us excellent training to listen to other cultures with humility, with respect and patience, even if we don't get what they are about at, at first. So we need to train ourselves in the act of decolonization to persistently knock on the doors of other languages than the superior colonial languages. Uh, we have to reinstate diachrony. So we have to remind ourselves that each word, each keyword, every word uh, encapsulates memory. It, uh, it is, even if it's, we look at diachronic linguistics, synchrony should be an important aspect of it, and I've already mentioned the upper story. Uh, I want to say that we should respect the technological genie, and I've talked a lot about this in my introduction, uh, that we have to understand how technology can alter our embodied forms of being and our cognitive processes. And we have to recognize the intricate four, the intricate relations between language and emotion. Well, those are prescriptions, and I, but I want to end on a personal note now uh, with a childhood memory that came back to me when we received the poster for this seminar just a few hours ago, which announced clearly that it was the aim of the present forum to challenge the notion of universal truth, universal truth. So this reminded me of Jail Austin. I work in pragmatics, and this is what he wrote. Under the heading truth, what we have in fact is not a simple quality nor a relation, indeed any one thing, but rather a whole dimension of criticism. So as decolonizers, we should of course look at Fanon and keywords and so on, but we could also look at these people who were uh, uh, inveigling against their own culture. So he says there's a lot of things to be considered under the dimension of truth. The facts, yes, but also the situation of the speaker, his purpose in speaking, his hearer, questions of precision, and so on. But this 
business about uh, uh, fragmenting truth, not seeing it as a monolithic entity, reminded me of my first lie. And I'm currently working on a book on deception. And um, I want to tell you the story very briefly, which is that, you know, uh, uh, because I think it brings out all the features uh, of what decolonization ought to imply. Uh, when I was about four years old, I was sitting outside with uh, the person who helped around the house while my parents were playing Scrabble in English inside the house. And uh, we had an argument, uh, Medina and I, about whether that time of the day was evening or whether it was night. Now I said it was night and Medina said it was evening. And he said, why don't you go in and ask your parents who know English, which neither of us did. And I did, and they, they said, well, of course it's evening. But I went back and told Medina, it is night. So this was a linguistic story and to, uh, the guilt of it has never left me. So all the emotions of guilt and moral ambiguity of language hegemony. My parents spoke English, we did not. Class of historical inheritance and memory of unequal power and access. We, neither of us knew English, but we knew it was important. And alienation, all these effects were something that could be visited even on a four-year-old child and her interlocutor in a post-colonial state. And I believe that some of these dilemmas remain with us still, which is why writing keywords or bringing together keywords was like an adventure of wonder, seeing the world anew again in terms of these basic alienating categories. Thank you, and I'm done for now. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Baya Nair, and thank you, Dr. De Sousa. Um, so now I invite you to ask questions to each other uh, about things that haven't been said and maybe things that you were not even expecting in this question, right? So uh, let, let, let's enjoy this moment of interaction. Okay, so can I go? Of course. Yes, so I'll begin with very small questions and then we can build up to a real fight. So. I wanted to ask Peter, you know, about the very first word that he mentioned, which was juta. And um, he explained it as one where you don't really uh, eat from the plate or drink from the glass, which has been used by a lower caste person. But first we need to understand what is a lower caste person in our society and then understand whether the system of caste, the structure of system of caste really can be applied elsewhere as well. Because Louis, du Louis Dumont, who looked at caste, said caste is a state of mind. It is, you have to get to it. So what is this state of mind? And this is why I asked about whether decoloniality is a state of mind. So with Peter, I wanted to ask Peter, for me, Juta means not necessarily drinking from the glass of a lower caste person, but drinking from anybody's glass or anybody's, uh, it, it, it could be an American, it could be a child. I, I have been trained not to touch anything which has been uh, touched by the lips of another and caste is there but it's not the only constraint. This constraint applies to everyone and it's part of a large pollution complex. First of all, people don't have it. What I want to ask Peter is about his interpretation of this word. He made it caste related. To my mind, it is caste which has infiltrated all other spheres and therefore is a part of a way of thinking, which is hegemonic, which he did say, but it is also not to do only with upper caste, lower caste, which is a system I would have to explain or we would have to explain. It is to do with the ways in which we visualize it. Now, Peter and I visualize it differently. He thinks of it in terms of caste, I don't. 
So I want to know, and we are both Indians. So I want to know, can, can he explain to me why he explained it in terms of caste? Okay, uh, uh, thank you. That's, that's, that's a good entry point for us to uh, have a friendly quarrel, right? Uh, <laughs> No, I, I chose the word juta quite deliberately because uh, I, I wanted to uh, signify to, to the community that's listening to us uh, that through that one word, one can enter uh, the structure of social stratification in Indian society. Uh, the system of so social stratification carries with it not just uh, you know, a uh, system of, of superior and subordinate in social terms, but carries with it, with it deep cultural meanings. And those cultural meanings uh, constitute relationships of power. Those cultural meanings inferiorize. Those cultural meanings uh, make some superior, make some inferior. And therefore, they have created a whole body of uh, practices and spaces which are which in which people are located and are expected to conf to, to remain. So juta is uh, while while uh, it's it's largely used in the context of food and water, uh, basically refers to this cultural uh, edifice of domination and inferiorization. In that sense, it shares it shares a commonality with cultural. Uh, with, with cultural domination and, and, and exploitation in other societies as well. You know, race, it shares, it, it shares a commonality with race. It shares a commonality, say, with, with um, you know, with the, um, uh, the segregation of towns and cities. So having said that, uh, now the, the description that you have given is you, you, you referred to it as, as uh, in your mind, being primarily or being significantly or predominantly uh, hygienic, that that no, you not don't at all. polluting, uh, polluting. Yeah, so pol but polluting with reference to with with reference to cleanliness, with reference to that if you if you drink from somebody, yeah. So if if that is not the case, because remember there are cultures in many parts of the world where everybody eats from a common plate. You know, uh, in, in, in West Asia and in large parts of uh, the world, people eat. I mean, there, there's a common plate, and everybody's dipping in and sharing. So, so, uh, so, why does why does the concept of polluting carry such traction in India? It carries traction in India because it, it's a it, it it comes from a certain structure of social stratification and 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 and, and it's accompanying cultural practices. Uh, which uh, which then get which then get embedded and then acquire a certain fixity in social life because it's not it's not it's not uh, it's 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 not a universal truth it's not a universal practice so so I think that's the point and and then it gets it gets uh, glossed over with hygiene and cleanliness and other things but it's ulti it ultimately a, a cultural practice of domination and exclusion. So Peter, I wanted, I, I chose this word initially for our keywords book, I did, because yeah. I felt that it shared, and that's why I'm focusing on it, uh, it shared an important uh, intersection with the idea of truth. Now, in there, so for this, for the linguist, you need to, need to know the phonological system of India. We have two words. One is Juta, which is the word Peter mentioned, and I included, and the other one, other word is chuta, which chuta, where the aspiration is on the first syllable, and that means untruthful. So even mispronouncing the word is leads you into a conundrum of, and it's just a phonological difference, a small phonological difference. And I thought, how interesting that there is juta, which is involves the pollution complex, and of course, really the social hierarchies that go without saying, uh, but, and that is important to India, but it is a phone's breath away from juta, ju, ju, juta, juta, which is a liar. 
Now, and, and to me, Indians are able not only to understand the pollution complex and the hierarchies, whether it originated with the high caste or wherever it originated, but we don't know because it's such an old word. Uh, but what we do know is that Indians are able to reflexively play with this land, with this pair of terms. Uh, they are able to pun with it. They are able to reflect on the notion of truth. And that is why I think that being an insider within languages and knocking on the doors of languages, which are not our own, is so important because we are able to see how delicate and malleable is the notion of language. So in talking about key words, I think we need to bear in mind that there's a huge element of play and of phonology, of lexicology, of trances, para, paras, and so on and so forth. That is, us, that is very important to concentrate on. So Peter, now you can ask me a question, but I think pollution is a really important word. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, is I'm, untruthfulness. I think uh, it's wonderful that you made that wonderful distinction between uh, pollution and, and, and untruth. And, and that's, you know, in that sense, it, it, it underscores once again uh, the value of our keyword project, which is what we were trying to do. You know, that, that here, you know, if, if you were to just use the word polluted and, 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 and untruth, you wouldn't be able to capture all the meanings. And, and, and these, therefore, as, a, as, a, as an anthropologist or as a, as a sociologist, if you want to describe India, it would make more sense to use the word juta or juta than to use the word truth uh, or pollution. So that I think that that point I think has gone home. Now, uh, yeah, let me ask you another question because you know, since we are speaking to uh, this very uh, interesting platform, I mean, I, I, mine is not a derivative question. Mine is, do you think our project? Do you think something that we've attempted? Because you know, there were moments when we thought it was an impossible project. Uh, you know, trying to trying to get entries from all the Indian languages, the recognized Indian languages, uh, and uh, from different cultural zones, uh, recognizing that it would be uh, you know unrepresentative and could never be comprehensive. Do you? But but we've succeeded. We've we've got we've got a volume out. We've we've got something that the world can 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 uh, see and hopefully be excited by, and maybe even be. Do you think? Uh, other language zones, like you know, regions of say East Africa or, or, or West Asia, do you think they could do something similar? Do you think this project can travel? Because you know, why should they just be seen it as an exotic Indian exercise? Why can't we have this global collaboration which can really shake the citadel of dominant yeah. languages? I think that's an important question, but we could, there have been many keywords books, right? This is not the first one. So one of the things we have to uh, understand is that the, uh, the idea of keywords itself has traveled extensively from Raymond Williams. Now, Raymond Williams, as I say in my introduction, uh, talked about uh, doing his keywords project uh, in 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 uh, uh, because when he came back from the war, that is the Second World War, one of the things that he found was that people were still using words like democracy or freedom. But they, he said, he was talking to a friend, and it came to him that. People were using the same words, but they were using them in a completely different way, and that's. Uh, mapping that moment in language when things change are very important. So is very important as a linguist. So for example, I started noticing in the 1990s that people were using words like outsource and public private partnership and liberalization. And these words were new to my ears. And later I found that outsource became crowdsource uh, or not did, was linked to crowdsource and other forms and uh, words like memes started being used quite rapidly. That was a term I was familiar with 
from evolution, evolutionary studies, but not from the, in the common sphere. So in some ways, I would like to say that um, when you have a notion like a word, words travel. In India has a huge lexicon of words that we have borrowed from the English. And English has taken Indian words. So words travel, uh, lex the lexicon as the keywords project has already traveled. So what we have to really think about now is whether our sort of project or our interpretation of keywords has really, can really travel to nations which or societies or cultures which are seeking to decolonize. And if they are, what are the particular features which our keywords book has to offer, which is more than a record of a shift of meaning. And I think it has three or four lessons, and I think it can travel if others are interested in these experiments. And I highlight experiments because I think of keywords like Emperor Akbar's project as an experiment. The first thing is collaboration. Can we bring together groups of people to discuss words as you have so kindly allowed us to do today in, in this Penn State Forum? But also, can we use words of everyday usage? And can we borrow this notion of elevation, what Peter calls elevation, and I don't call elevation, but bring into everyday usage the things which we have. So people may not be bothered with a word like ahimsa, which means nonviolence, but they will certainly know the word chappal or juta, because chappal is something we all wear. Slippers have to be left outside the house in many homes, because again, there are all these notions of pollution. So everybody knows the word sari, which we have in this volume. But do they know its etymology? Do they know its structure? So I think these everyday material culture objects have to be garnered and gathered in these keywords volume because they are a measure of the everyday lived experience of societies which are not the, uh, the Western colonizers. So material words, things like acronyms, because acronyms are a phenomenon of modernity, will people put acronyms together in their society. So the, and borrowings, I think borrowings are critical because then we can compare across all colonial societies, which are the words we've borrowed. So if these are some of the strategies or tactics we've used in order to make it a more, a decolon decolonizing project and, uh, I, Peter, the last thing I want to say is that, you know, Fanon said uh, what, uh, in looking at the Hegel master slave relationship, is that, um, you know, what the uh, colonial master wants from his slave is not recognition, which is what Hegel's uh, master wanted, but work. So, you know, the nature of labor intellectual labor is being rewritten through projects like ours. And that's where I think if we can come to some agreements of the types of labor we put into a keywords project, the types of words which we might want to concentrate on, the types of collaboration, then I think this project will travel. Otherwise, I think maybe not. And so we live in hope and anticipation and also fear. We don't really know what's going to happen, but we put it out there and it does contain elements which no other keyword book contains. And that is a deliberate de decolonizing move, in my opinion. So to travel, Peter, maybe, and maybe not, because the right to reject is important. Can't hear you, Peter. I can't hear you. Can't hear you. I, I, I said now the discussion can travel to Makoni. I think we've yes. taken yes. up enough time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, 
I have a couple of uh, a couple of comments, um, but let me uh, begin by by thanking you for putting together this um, keywords for or from or in India, and say that uh, when I was reading your work, my favorite words uh, were the word file and the way it's called <laughs> because I I could from an African perspective um, understand the notion of file that if you go to a bureaucratic office and your file is not there, it's more or less like you don't exist so to speak so in, in a sense the point I'm trying to make at a very pedantic level is that yes what you have got are keywords for India but it's possible that they may overlap with certain conceptual meanings in other geographical regions as well. So it would be quite interesting to have a follow-up project which uh, uses some of your concepts, but tries to see how those words are uh, play themselves out in a different region, for example. Because at the moment, by focusing on India only, you by default create an impression that this is just uniquely an Indian phenomenon. But yeah. if it is going to be a decolonial project, it will be interesting to see whether in actual fact these words and meanings have similar meanings in different parts of the world. In West Africa, for example, Southern Africa, or even in South America. Then the other part that I, found quite interesting, which I wanted to discuss with you is this. Let me quote the statement that was made by Peter towards the end of his epilogue. He says this, we see our book as belonging firmly in the literature on the politics of knowledge as it seeks to partner the many attempts to flatten the knowledge asymmetries between the North and the South. It has subversive intent it seeks to disturb the regular vocabulary of social sciences and humanities and to disrupt the flow of communication between the North and the South. Right. Now, my question is this. Then you proceed. It seeks to upset the complacency of scholars who think their language is adequate to the task of representing their world of inquiry. It seeks to suggest that their language is deficient and that new words and concepts are required. My question to both of you is, how far successful did you think you got? To, to what extent were you successful in accomplishing these noble objectives? Peter, you made the claim, so you go. <laughs> no, uh, see, this, first of all, uh, the, the, the exercise has just begun. The book is only okay. a year out. Okay. And, 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 and COVID has overtaken its dissemination. But uh -huh. uh, I mean, you know, having invitations like yours, and we, we have had an opportunity to discuss the book uh, in, 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 in Basel, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and, and in three locations in India. So e even what we have attempted here is new to India itself. So okay. it's already beginning, it's already beginning to, to, uh, give a sense of confidence yes. to scholars who come, and, and I'll use the metaphor, scholars from outside the metropolis. And by metropolis, yes. I mean yes. those, who, those who have, you know, who have studied uh, within, the, within the languages, the language zones mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of, the, you know, of, the, of the dominant languages. Mm -hmm. uh, that's beginning to happen. You know, democratization of knowledge in India has brought in scholars from uh, you know, language areas which is, where there is no English, where there is no French, where there is no Portuguese, and 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 they are beginning to they are beginning to uh, offer idioms. They are beginning to to do things with grammar that were earlier frowned upon and and, and earlier uh, treated as inferior. Are now beginning to get respectability. I, I mean, yes. I, I, how successful? Uh, it's it's a long project, and that is why I deliberately asked Rukmini the question. Hopefully, 
you we can hand over the baton to you and you can run with it uh, mm. within your community because mm. i think this has to be a collaborative exercise ours yeah. was the first yeah. 200 or to get you know you you said uh, you know it 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 gives the impression that it's an it it it, it only works for india but you must remember india is a subcontinent you know it's not yes. i mean yes. it it pretends to be a nation state but it's much more than that so so when these words you know uh, are introduced into the cover of a book mm-hmm. people in other language zones get quite excited they so oh, but we'd like to so already uh, you know if you want to measure success we have requests from two language zones in india who want to do something similar uh, in their language zone Okay. So, 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 so in 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 Northwest India, there has been a request that we'd like to come up with hundred words which cover both India and Pakistan. You know, this is the kind of Punjabi speaking area of yes. of, yeah. of Western, and we'd like to come up with the key words for that region. A similar request has come up from from uh, from South India, from a region Karnataka, saying we'd like to do something similar. Now, it's not a and we are we are nobody to give permission. Mm-hmm. we only have produced this book and we know that this is just just uh, you know a, a showcase that it is possible so mm-hmm. other regions of the world whether latin america i, I can see my mm-hmm. friend lin lin mario mm-hmm. over there <laughs> so he he if he picks it up and, and runs with it in brazil we'd be delighted uh, and and you know i mean that's it so 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 it's mm-hmm. it's it's the beginning of what i hope when i say Uh, will force the dominant hum- humanities and social science community out of their comfort zones i was hoping that when we go to seminars we would use words without translation yes. you know so that they are expected to know these words if they are going to be writing about india i don't have uh-huh. to say jhuta and then put in brackets polluted or, uh-huh. or you know jhuta jhuta and put in brackets santru they must know these words it must be uh-huh. part of my seminar presentation that's the point i want to make that's when okay can i add something yes you can add something then i will ask another question then we can move on well the only thing i wanted to add here peter has already spoken about how people have been enthusiastic within india uh, about doing this and we do hope that the model can spread uh, but the other thing that i work to do it in this novel is to in this book in this volume is to set up a kind of template for how to write a keyword because raymond williams never tells us any of that and he we set up these rubrics you know um uh, imagine uh, the political imaginaries and so on and so forth so i think that there again we could have a chance for talking at the meta level that is we should be able to see whether this template for writing a keyword works for other people and that's why we deliberately put it in so there is a heuristics here it's not okay. just the concept it's uh-huh. the heuristics and how we handle the heuristics otherwise these will be all separate separate bubbles and okay. not connected but if we use similar terms of reference then that would, which are not word related but structure related uh, or theme related i think that would be important and so i would say templates heuristics these sort of uh, low level things are also important when discussing the viability of a keywords project in any society and uh, uh, the ability to bring together people which i think peter has and i do not so okay. yeah uh, if i can continue with that when i was reading um your keywords one of the key issues that um kept coming back to me was that uh, frequently the contributors would try and attribute the origins mm-hmm. or some of the words to sanskrit for example so as i tried to apply that framework to another context i kept asking myself what about in context in which you don't have a language that might have the same status of sanskrit what um, rubric or template would you give your contributors right how would you ask them to write the etymology of these words 
in India, because of the presence of Sanskrit, you could eventually go back to Sanskrit, so to speak. But um, there is no language that occupies a similar slot like Sanskrit in Africa that I know of at the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I, can I answer this yes, question? You can, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the, I thought very hard about whether to include in our template the notion of etymology, which Raymond Williams had, and yes. almost all <laughs> keyword volumes have. And you were about, I think, half the words in our book don't have a Sanskrit oh. etymology. Mm -hmm. So of the 250 words, maybe over 100 don't have a Sanskrit okay. etymology. The, uh, and you will find that here again, you have this hierarchical notion, uh -huh. um, which is some of these high level words have a Sanskrit etymology. Yes, yes, yes. But on the other hand, a word like democracy does not. Does not. And okay. democracy is in our book. So, you know, mm -hmm. there are lots of words, tax, which comes from mm -hmm. the Latin, does not. VIP uh -huh. does not. So if you actually make lists, and I uh -huh. did, so uh, most, many of the words don't know they come from, uh, you know, uh, 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 let's say a Portuguese origin, like Susegad or some other origin. So it's, so the question of etymology, look, uh -huh. when children learn language, Sintri, they love. don't know the etymologies of words, right? But they still, uh, we all acquire language without knowing etymology. But when we go to a, a, because a word, as I said, is encapsulated memory, often people want to know where does this word come from? Yeah. To your deeper problem, but your deeper problem is, what if we don't have etymologies? Yes. I think that's, uh, what if we can't track this word back? I say, so what? Mm -hmm. Children learn words without etymologies. We acquire languages, new languages without etymologies. I don't think, I think etymology is probably the least important aspect of a word in societies like, you know, a lot of the European languages go back to Latin. We can go to Sanskrit, but that is what I would call contingency or happenstance. I don't think that that is the core of the word, okay, the core okay. is to give it importance semantically, pragmatically, in terms of language negotiations. So for me, no, it's not important. And if you okay. don't have it, leave it out. Leave it out, okay, okay. Let me stop there because I'll come back later on. Um, who, who's coming in next, Lynn? Thank, yes, thank you, uh, Makoni. Uh, Lynn, Maria, over to you. Thank you for having a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter and Rukmini. Uh, the uh, I think it's wonderful what you've done. Um, yeah. And com considering your uh, your la last comments, um, I'd like to recuperate something from uh, Rukmini's uh, introduction, which is linguistic incontinence, Rukmini. <laughs> uh, which I think is is an important notion to us in in language, as many of us on this platform are looking at. Um, we're trying to decolonize linguistic theory, which has imposed, which is basically uh, Eurocentric and has imposed on us notions of language as bounded phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Rukmini, uh, it's curious, uh, this is something which relates to Peter as well. Uh, when I was at the IIAS, Peter, thanks to you, um, I discovered the work of uh, uh, Lakshman Kupchandani, which the IIS has published. And uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, why he, he makes a critique of uh, Eurocentric sociolinguistics by saying that multilingualism in Europe has got nothing to do with multilingualism in, in, in India. Multilingualism in Europe sees languages as one plus one plus one. He gives this <laughs> arithmetical formula. And he says in India, it's more like one times one times one. So the, the sum of one times one times one is one, meaning no languages, the, the, the languages are indistinguishable, whereas one plus one plus one gives three, which is a European notion of multilingualism, meaning they are dis distinguishable, distinct languages. So I think that 
linguistic incontinence is extremely important uh, as a, <laughs> as a, a decolonial strategy. And um, one of the, as you said, Rukmini, it's a, uh, uh, you wondered if uh, decoloniality is a state of mind. I would say from a Latin American perspective, my colleagues here on this platform may be speaking from different African perspectives, for example, from a Latin American perspective, which involved, which, in which colonization involved settlers coming in um, and then uh, taking over uh, as natives, right? So we mm. have this whole uh, uh, notion of culpability, right? So culpability here is part of our decolonial strategy is where the dominant class in Brazil, which sees itself as colonized are also the colonizers, right? So, uh, so the first step in decolonization in Brazil is to recognize oneself as an agent of colonization, right? Before you can embark on any decolonial activity here. Um, now, uh, uh, coming back to the linguistic incontinence, the two things which also appear in the work of, um, of uh, Kupchandani when he, he talks about the plurilingual ethos in, in India. Uh, he says uh, the plurilingual ethos in India involved two aspects. One is synergy, which means collaboration. And the other is serendipity, which involves chance, right? <laughs> so both of these together, when, when you're uh, in uh, Rukmini, I'm not sure if it was you or if it was Peter gave the, the example of uh, uh, when you're in a chai stall, uh, listening mm. to what's going on around you. I did. It's these two things which come into play. Uh, the, there has to be a collaboration in wanting to understand what the other person oh, is saying. Right? And the, the second aspect of serendipity is chance. There's nothing that will guarantee whether you do understand or not. <laughs> but when you don't understand, you pretend to, right? <laughs> because the important, yes. thing, the important thing in collaboration is the sentiment, the feeling, right? Uh, and this is something we have difficulty in linguistics in dealing with, right? Um, and this uh, 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 brings me back to the idea of uh, uh, the, the keywords themselves. So keywords, unlike dictionaries, are not instruments of normatization, right? Uh, dictionaries were. So uh, when you, you mentioned if, uh, etymology should come in or not. Etymology definitely comes into standardizing dictionaries, normatizing dictionaries, right? And what my reading of your, and I'd be interested to see if you agree or not, my reading of your keywords is that, is this play, it's as if you're reversing the colonial strategy in India of, of the, the Brits wearing mufti and going native, right? <laughs> Yes, Matthew Arnold and Asari, we used yeah. to call it. <laughs> so yeah. What you're doing in English is exactly the opposite, right? You're, you're, you're going mufti in the, in the corridors of Buckingham Palace. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, so what's happening there is uh, uh, you're offering your keywords uh, not as a strategy of uh, an instrument of normatization, but an opposite, you're, you're saying, in spite of the fact that we are giving explanations to these words, which you probably don't understand, you're introducing a level of opacity in the hegemony, mm. right? Which, which is saying that, look, and this is a, a decolonial strategy, especially in Latin America, we are not trying to, as what post-colonialism did, we are not trying to simply substitute a more truer representation, which was uh, for a false representation, which the colonized had, colonizers had of us. What we're trying to say is that all representations are produced in context. So they are yes. bodies, localized bodies behind the, the representations. So what mm -hmm. you are trying to do is basically mark what I call marked, mark the unmarked. Mm -hmm. You're trying to right, denormatize de the whole process of uh, existent 
hegemonic normatization. I'm not sure if you agree with me or not. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thanks so much. I'm dying to say lots of things, but Peter, if I start, I won't stop. So uh, would you like to go first? But I really do want a response uh, when you're done. Peter, I, you can't be heard. No, Rukmini, you go ahead. I mean, I think uh, I'd, I'd be happy to listen to you. And I'll say something towards the end, yeah. Okay, so, you know, you, I mean, thank you first for picking up on the incontinence notion, which I think is really important, was important to be in playing with the notion of decolonization and subversion. And uh, I also uh, uh, kind of am very grateful that you have expanded it. But beyond that, let me begin with Lachman Kupchandani. So Kupchandani did this excellent work on the census, but he also, when he came to, uh, you know, to the IPRA conference, which we'd organized at IIT, uh, he didn't actually come, so I made sense of what he wanted to say, but he made a very interesting distinction, which I think is also relevant to our thinking. And the distinction we made bet was between language professionals, linguists and who do the done thing and practice their craft within the safe walls of academia, and what he called language planners or language visionaries. So professionals versus planners. And I think the project, uh, and I, try, I, I, dis I discussed this with him, and he was uh, upset about the idea that we had all turned ourselves into suit boot professionals. We never wore mufti, as you put it. We stayed in our lanes. And um, I, I noticed that in a lot of Western academia, you have to stay in your la lane. So if you're working on linguistics, you certainly shouldn't be writing poetry or doing or keeping it aside. And in India, for two or three reasons, we have not been able to maintain this, one of which is that we temperamentally stray into each other's lanes. We are not professionals in that sense. And so in our book, for example, the Keywords book, we have historians, doctors, lawyers, um, there's no profession, engineers, uh, every philosophers, all of whom are talking, cross-talking to each other. And that enriches the idea of the person who thinks ahead with language. So this is Lakshman, Lakshman Kupchandani's distinct, distinction between the language planner. And the other thing he says is that language professionals want to remain anonymous. Even if they are interested in certain causes, they're not show, they don't want to show their hand. They want to stay in their safe zone. Whereas language planners have this enthusiasm about planning for their country and they come out of the woodwork. And I think that's a useful distinction to bear in mind when we're thinking of further phases of this project. Now, uh, oh, and we're thinking of going ahead. You also talked about how, and I, you know, my brother lives in Brazil, I go to Brazil to lecture and so on. So I know that a continent well, and um, they're not that continent, that country well. And one of the things that really interests me is the linguistic relationship between not only the racial relationship so much as the linguistic relationships from which I believe we have much to learn. So you're saying the, the locals have, that is, I presume the rulers have to decolonize, not in, in the sense of thinking of them, uh, in the sense that they shouldn't think they're colonized, they should think of themselves as colonizers. I think that that is very, that's a very pertinent observation for us in keywords, because, the, uh, because India is a highly uh, colonial society in that sense, and the role that Sanskrit has played 
is really critical in an English today in creating the new Brahmins. So I think the internal decolonization, if it does not exist or if it is muted, will not work uh, 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 you know, as a, as, without that internal decolonization, we do not have a viable decoloniality model. So those are two important points that you've made for me. There are many others that I would like to talk about, like the words we've used, the words we've picked. Have we been very influenced by our own context and background? And is that wrong? Because Peter and I are situated. We see what we see with the eyes that we see. And that is an important part of context. We can't throw it away. We can't get rid of it. We are embodied selves. We are colors. We are races. So I, that's why I think we need to look at also at race theory. Uh, and why I say this is we all know that we are all genetic twins. You know, we are 99.9% similar, age, sex, color, uh, every parameter is, in, is, in, you know, is encoded in the tiniest jiggle of a chromosome. Yet culture is this vast magnifying glass, which blows up these tiny differences and makes them so huge. So when we valorize culture, one of the things we forget is the distinctions between people are very, very, very small. Uh, and we have to try to remember that as well. And I find it very difficult to remember these two facts together as a linguist. So, so you're, 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 uh, I, I, I will think further on how to bring these insights, uh, and I'm sure Peter will, into our next keywords, um, next step in keywords and decolonization. If there's no other question, then I'll sort of also briefly respond. I, I saw Lynn Mario's uh, uh, intervention more as a comment than a question to us. And, and I, therefore, I just want to add to that one small detail uh, and, and one give you some background as to the production of the book. The detail is uh, very, very uh, we, we thought very strategically that the first release of the book would be in the House of Commons in the UK because the book was published in England. And we had actually uh, an event planned and everything was fine, but then COVID disrupted everything. It was, it was exactly around the same time because we wanted to go right into the heart of, of, of the colonial you know, power uh, and, 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 and defend our book. Uh, but unfortunately that didn't happen. Secondly, uh, uh, now that the book is out, uh, one gets the impression that we had a we had a roadmap of how to produce this book. We didn't. It took it. It, it was uh, serendipity worked a lot. There were you know we had long lists of words that that we wanted. Uh, we 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 tried to find contributors. We couldn't. We 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 bullied a, we bullied friends and colleagues. Uh, they they promised. 50% of them only delivered. And when you, when, you, when you go through the book, you will notice that there was no, there's no single uh, philosophical or political perspective from which all the entries are written. It's very plural because, uh, because uh, we, you know, we, we gave a, a, a structure, a template, but we did not insist on a, a, on a perspective. So the book in that sense is, 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 is very plural and each entry speaks about the, the, the location of the author, not of the editors. Uh, the, 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 uh, so, you know, that we were able to get 250 entries itself. If, if we did nothing else, that would merit us a place in history. You know? <laughs> because as, as any of you know, you know getting, getting people to contribute to an edited volume is itself an impossible task. And to get 200 authors uh, to, to contribute 250 entries, uh, was very difficult. We we were hoping for more, and then of course, uh, you know, reducing the the length of the entries because the publisher said only two hundred and two hundred thousand yes. words. We had three hundred thousand words, 
So uh, yeah, so this was the difficulty. So so now what looks like a very clear, very philosophically worked out uh, you know manuscript was actually something that that emerged through a lot of struggle and a lot of luck and a lot of goodwill <laughs> and, uh, and and prayer. Towards the end of it, a lot of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Lynn Mario, for your uh, great question and gr great comment. Um, so we are actually, we are about to wrap up the uh, formal part of our session. Uh, so um, if you still have time, please stay with us for the um, after party so that you can still ask questions to Rukmini and Peter or to other people in the forum. Um, Dr. Maconi, do you have anything to say before yes, I yes. wrap up and stop recording? Okay. I, I do. Um, when I was listening to the conversation, I kept going back to my understanding of African pragmatics in a decolonized form. And I asked myself, what would be the axioms that underpin African, uh, African pragmatics? And I identified, I think, at least five. One, it will be opaqueness. The second one will be obscurity. The third will be ambiguity. The fourth will be long-windedness. And the fifth will be circuitousness. Why I'm mentioning that is that in any decolonial uh, project, I think it's important to, see, to realize that the world that you want to describe may be completely different from the world of Western scholarship. The axioms that I have um, identified here are completely different from what would be the axioms in, let's say, speech ads and in pragmatics. In, in other words, if you're going to describe African pragmatics in its own right, you have to assume that it might be completely different from the conversational principles that guide pragmatics in Western scholarship. Then having said that, when I was listening to the conversation and you were identifying some of the principles that should underpin decoloniality, I then um, added three more. Um, I added innovation, animation, and transgression to your notions of infiltration, elevation, and appropriation and population. What I was trying to say is that what your book has done, at least from to me, is to ask me, uh, to force me to ask a very practical question. Conceptually, how would you go about trying to decolonize linguistics? What are the procedures that you would set in motion in order to realize that? Then I realized that in order for that to take place, I need to identify the analytical and philosophical principles that I think I would want to deploy in order to create this vision of a new linguistics that I'm interested in. Yeah, that's my, but this, this, is a, this is a wonderful book. I'm telling you, Peter, we're going to have our own keywords for Africa soon. And I will invite both of you as, the, as consultants. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Th thank you so much for wrapping up, uh, Dr. Maconi. I will stop recording and uh, I hand it over to Kim for the informal. <laughs>